Isaac Newton managed to explain Kepler's third law by invoking gravity and his laws of motion. Kepler's third law stated that for two objects that were orbiting some kind of central object, such as planets orbiting the sun, if you compared their semi-major axes and their periods of orbit, they would follow a relationship. P squared was proportional to A cubed. So the period of object one squared divided by its semi-major axis cubed would give the same number as the period of the second object squared over the semi-major axis of the second object cubed. As long as you're working in the same units, um, same time units on the top and same length units on the bottom, this all works out. Typically we do period in earth years and we do semi-major axis in AU, but as long as the units are consistent on either side of this relationship, you can work out if you know one planet's semi-major axis and period of orbit and another planet's semi-major axis or period of orbit, you can calculate the missing piece of information. Kepler didn't have any reason why this must be so. He merely had the data from the planets and saw that they followed this law. Enter Isaac Newton years later, and Isaac Newton works out a few things. One thing he works out is that for two objects that have mass, I'm going to label one as big M and one as little m, separated by some distance d, that they would attract each other, that there would be some force of attraction that was measurable. And it was proportional to both masses and inversely proportional to the distance squared. This means if I double the distance, I would get a quarter of the original force because one over two squared is one over four. If each mass was scaled up individually, that would increase the force as well. What we typically write is F equals some number G which is just a constant. This is what we call the gravitational constant times big M times little m over d squared. What the gravitational constant really does is it works stuff out so that the masses can be in kilograms and that the d can be in meters. Therefore, F is going to be in a unit of force called newtons. And one Newton is approximately one-fifth of a pound. So they give a sense of how, how big of a force it would be if you had one kilogram of force separated by one distance uh, or one meter of distance. Um, you'd have a really tiny amount of force acting in between because that gravitational constant, 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11, the units it gets are newtons, times meter squared over kilogram squared. So what this states is if this mass is one kilogram and this mass is one kilogram and I separated the distance between them as one meter, there would be this many newtons of force, a really, really tiny amount. It's just to show that the gravitational force relative to units we're used to is really tiny. There was another thing that Newton worked out. It's related to his objects in motion stay in motion. Let's say I am swinging a tennis ball of some sort on a, on a circle, circular path. So I'm moving it around in a circle. At the tippy top of the path, let's make this more tippy top. If the ball is going in the clockwise direction, all of the ball's velocity is pointed that way. So if I were to let go of the ball at the top, the ball would continue forward and then it would start to fall down on a parabolic trajectory. It would, it would no longer be bound by the string and then it would be subject to gravity or whatever is pulling down on it. At every point, if I swing this ball constantly, 
and make it go around the circle at a smooth rate, that velocity is tangent to the circle at all points because I am pulling in with some force, a centripetal force, a center facing force, keeping the ball changing direction. So what I am doing, if I swing a ball in a circle, it's constantly changing the direction of the ball. This is kind of like if I have the sun and I have the earth, and the earth is going around on somewhat of a circular path, there is a gravitational force of attraction, and this is the existing velocity of the earth. So what the sun really does is it keeps changing the direction of the earth's velocity. And there's a relationship that Newton worked out, and you can look up some other video that explains a bit more about this, but that that center-facing force, we call F centripetal, to keep things moving on a smooth circular track, if I have a circle of some radius r, and I have a certain amount of tug that I can give, there is a speed at which the ball is going to move around. We call it v squared over r. So, in the Newtonian context, Newton realized that the gravitational force between the Earth and the Sun was equal to the centripetal force, or merely that gravity was the cause of the center-facing force. So I can rearrange some stuff. I can replace what's in here with my expression for gravitational attraction and we'll use this Earth-Sun distance. I'm gonna call it R in this case. I had previously called it D. But we're just again representing the distance between the two bodies. So the big M in this case will be the Sun, and the little m will be the Earth. I can equate this, sorry, I forgot a little m there. I, f I can equate this to the centripetal force needed to keep the Earth moving in a circular track. A little side note here, this thing here represents just the centripetal acceleration. So now I have this equation that is relating quantities on both sides. The gravitational force causes a centripetal force. So the gravitational force is what is changing the direction of the Earth around the Sun not really speeding up or slowing, slowing it down. Yes, when you consider the elliptical orbits, but let's just look at this idealized case to show where Kepler's third law really comes from. If I look at this algebraically, I can see some stuff cancels out on both sides. The m's cancel. That little m represents the mass of the Earth. One factor of r also cancels. So what I'm left with, I'm going to rearrange this, g capital M equals v squared. I'm going to bring this little r, one factor of r, to their side. This is starting to look a little bit like Kepler's third law. Um, let's look a little bit at circles. So if the Earth is traveling on a circular path of radius r around the sun at a speed of v, then what we have is v the distance traveled is the circumference of the circle, 2 pi times r. And p is the period that it takes to go around, the time it takes to go around, because velocity, in this case, is going to be distance divided by time. So I can put this into this equation as well. So now I get g times m equals 2 pi r over p. And the whole thing is squared. Maybe you can see how this is going to connect back to Kepler's second or Kepler's third law. Let's simplify this and get rid of some parentheses. So now we have 4 pi. I have one factor of r squared and then another factor of r. So this is r cubed divided by p squared. Let's rearrange this, and I have p squared times g times capital M equals 4 pi times r cubed. This is looking very close to
the Kepler's third law, where p squared, let's rearrange this a little bit, 4 pi over g times capital M times r cubed. So what this means, this is the piece. Maybe, maybe you still can't see Kepler's third law here, but this would be period. This r we can interpret as the semi-major axis. This is constant. This is a gravitational constant. It doesn't change. It doesn't matter what the period is or the semi-major axis is. That g will stay the same. Pi is also constant. So this leaves m. m is the mass of the sun. And for planets, when you're comparing different planets that are going around the same sun, the mass is still the same. So what we have is a p squared is proportional to r cubed. But this gives us something even more general. This means if I know the mass of my central body, my bigger thing, capital M, and I have a littler mass, and it doesn't even matter what the mass is, I can calculate based on its distance and figure out what its period of orbit needs to be. Again, from this relationship based on what we've derived from Newton's universal law of gravitation and a little bit of his rules of motion, his centripetal force and acceleration. So this explains where Kepler's third law comes from. Kepler had the observational data to notice that this rule held and Newton was able to explain where the rule actually came from.